Thank you, Steve Rimpless and the band. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The 1997 Hall of Fame class of inductees is taking their seat on the front row. I'm Pat Hildebrand. I'm the executive director of the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame. And on behalf of the staff and the board of trustees, I would like to welcome you to this ceremony. This is a special day for the Hall of Fame and for these people on the front row as they join the group already inducted into the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame. In just a moment, the Pikes Peak Range Rider Pivots will post the colors. Please remain standing for the national anthem performed by Lila Moray. And following the anthem, the invocation will be given by Grant Atkinson from the Fellowship of Christian Cowboys. Would you please stand? Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you for a beautiful morning. We thank you for your love that's expressed in this day to us. And I thank you for the great sport of rodeo, for our PRCA, for these that are being inducted today. I thank you for those that have taken a strong stand, knowing you in a personal way, for their witness to so many around this world. I pray you'd continue to bless them. And each one that's here today, Father, as we honor you, we look at these great mountains above us reminded of your love through Jesus Christ, the privilege to know him in a personal way as Lord and Savior. We give you the praise for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you to Lila and Grant and the Pivots. The Pivots will have to leave a little before the ceremony today because they need to be at the rodeo performance this afternoon. So thank you now. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Lewis Pryor, who is the commissioner of the PRCA and also the chairman and president, chairman of the board and president of the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame. Thank you, Pat. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We so appreciate all of you being here. I know for some of you that we have already visited with this morning, you've come an awful long ways just today. Some all the way from the East Coast flying in this morning and having to leave as soon as these ceremonies are over. The dedication to the individual being honored here today is uh, truly amazing. And we appreciate all of you who have uh, made that trek to be here, family, friends, uh, and the honorees themselves. Today, as we promised the honorees last night, we're trying to make this weekend something that they and their friends and family will always remember. Uh, earlier this morning, I visited with Tuff Hiedemann for a moment. He was at the special dinner last night along with the other honorees, and then he had a function afterwards, and he said, this is so, it's such a great weekend to be with family and friends and people I respect. Uh, it's a very special occasion. It's a humbling experience for these people uh, to be honored by one's peers, particularly in the world of sport, I believe there's not a greater honor because you are judged by those who you uh, reside with and when you're enshrined into the Hall of Fame, 
these honorees were judged by those who were here before. They join a class now of 149 individuals and animals. And for all those who will be honored in the future, this group of eight also establishes the mark by all those who follow will be judged. As the chairman of the selection committee of eight, I can assure you that it's a very, very difficult task. We go through mounds of materials of the nominations, and when it comes time to lift the hand to make that vote, you certainly take into consideration all those who have preceded the class that you're voting on. It's not easy. So many are deserving. But not everyone who rides, not everyone who ropes, not everyone who provides the animals, not everyone who is a contract personnel can be enshrined here. It is for the best of the best. It is for the champions, for those who will be looked up to, admired, and for those young people out there, someone that they conceive to strive for as an example of what they may one day be, and that's a champion. As a champion goes down the road, there are times when all they have is themselves, and all they have is their memories, and all they have is the accomplishments that they have achieved and they've received accolations for. But when those times and all you have is your memories, we want this to be one of those memories. We want for our honorees to think of this day when they have their time by themselves as something very, very special. So it's our pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame and the Board of Directors of the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association to these very special ceremonies today. The first that we will honor today is a special presentation of something that we started several years ago, and that was recognizing the rodeo committees. Those are the people and the volunteers across this country that make rodeo what it is today, because without the committees and those most valuable volunteers, you cannot have a rodeo. The National Western Stock Show and Rodeo began in 1906 when a group of local men interested in livestock staged the Denver Fat Stock and Feeder Show. That first show was held in a tent in the front of the Livestock Exchange Building and attracted 40 head of cattle, a few sheep and hogs, and 20 head of horses. Premiums were ribbons and glory. The National Western has been held ever since, with the exception of 1915, when the national epidemic forced cancellation. From that first performance, the National Western has grown to be one of the largest cattle exhibitions in the world and one of the top five rodeos in the nation. The Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame recognizes the National Western Stock Show and Rodeo, Denver, Colorado, for their pioneering effort, continuing support, and perpetuation of the sport of professional rodeo, presented on this ninth day of August, 1997. Pat Grant, please. to be here today. On behalf of the National Western, the Executive Committee, the staff, management, membership, I'm both proud and humbled to stand here in front of you. Proud from the standpoint that this is truly a noble achievement and a great honor. Humbled because truly there are many, many, many outstanding rodeos out there with whom we compete. The National Western believes, believes and is committed to very, very strongly to the great sport of rodeo. And the individual who guided me and brought me along and made me bullish on that is Ben Houston, my predecessor. And Ben, if you're out there, would you please stand? Former President, Vice Chairman. The National Western is committed to and believes strongly 
and the Rodeo Cowboy. It's committed to and believes strongly in the Rodeo Cowgirl. And why is that? In our judgment, they represent the best of values. Simple honesty, courage, individual responsibility. And I say that with a touch of irony. Because as I walked out last night, I was with Mr. and Mrs. Frost. And I could not help but recall and recognize the huge sacrifice that family and Lane made, the friendship between Lane and Tuff Edeman. Another great value that these wonderful people represent is integrity. Integrity because there is a loyalty to a way of life that is under challenge. For all these reasons, we're committed to and believe strongly in the great sport of rodeo. And yet every achievement, as you well know, is a function of leadership. The National Western Jubilee, 25th celebration in 1931, the general manager at that time was Cortland Jones. He worked for many, many years to bring the sport of rodeo to National Western. He succeeded, and that was the beginning. He was followed by the great general manager, John T. Kane III. And then many of you remember the wonderful man, general manager Willard Sims, who served from 1955 to 1978. And in that year, the mantle was passed to Chuck Sylvester, Chuck, would you please stand, because this general manager is an outstanding man who does a super job. And he has led the rodeo effort, but he's not been alone. As a member of the PRCA board, he's been with that great team, the Professional Rodeo Cowboy Association, and we're very proud and supportive of Chuck. But Chuck alone cannot do it. Also with Chuck is that rodeo team at the National Western. Mr. Guy Elliott, rodeo manager. Guy, would you please stand? Joe Trahan, who flew in from California. We appreciate all you do, Joe. Every great achievement, every great effort is leadership, but it's also a team. And we at the National Western pride ourselves in working toward quality, teamwork, and our teamwork and association with the PRCA. Commissioner, we're honored to be here. We're delighted to be here. And we thank you for all your great leadership as well. Thank you very much. Now for the presentation of the 1997 Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame inductee class. The first of that being in the contract personnel category, Bobby and Gene Clark. To do the introduction, a Hall of Famer himself, Mr. Clem McSpat. You know, before I tell you that when you look at the class of 97, you're looking at probably maybe the best, but none ever better since there's been a Hall of Fame when you look at the individuals. And then if I look down here at the queen crop, by golly, that's the best queen crop I've ever seen. They, uh, they are the prettiest ladies I believe I've ever seen. And we sure have a, as country boy in Eastern Oklahoma said, we got a right smart of them. 1949, I bummed a ride with Jim Shoulders came to my first convention. And I've missed one since then, our home burned about two nights before uh, the convention started and we canceled, of course, Don and I. 
And uh, I met a fella from Idaho Falls, Idaho, who is the chairman of the War Bonded Rodeo. He was county commissioner and later went on to become the uh, secretary of agriculture of the state of Idaho, a fellow named Harold West. Well, I didn't get a job, Jake, and went on home about two months later. The phone rang is a guy named Earl Hutchison, whom I didn't know. And he said that the year before, Cy Talon had announced he had about 10 rodeos, all his rodeos, and this year there were four of them that Cy couldn't announce. Well, you know about how that scared me. And he hired me for Idaho Falls and Pocatello and Burley and Winnemuck. I drove from Bushyhead, Oklahoma to Idaho Falls. I had 117 cowboys entered and I knew two of them. I knew Hoss Allen and I knew Freckles Brown. That's when I first met guys like Keith, uh, Keith Kinslow, who's here today, and Keith Murray and the Blaines and Glenn Hone and Lawson Four and all those guys that I'd never seen before. Got there a couple of days early, trying to make an impression, and I asked the committee who the clowns were and what acts they had. Well, they said we got a good act. They said we got a neighbor, a boy from up here in northern Idaho, that's got a couple of trained dogs. And I thought, oh, good Lord have mercy, a couple of trained dogs. The guy's name was Jay Sisler. And then I said, who are your clowns? Well, they said we got a couple of Californians. Well, ever since John Steinbeck wrote The uh, Grapes of Wrath, Okies and Prunies haven't exactly jibed all the time. And I said, who are they? Well, they said the Clark Boys. Well, I'd never heard of the Clark Boys. Of course, I learned later that they were born and reared in Oklahoma and then went to California. They were CIOs, California Improved Okies. They were good fellows. And that night, Swanee Kirby, on a Wednesday night, 47 years ago, Maybe this week, it was in August. Might have been 47 years ago, the day before yesterday. There was as much contract talent in that arena as there has ever been in a rodeo up to then and up to this day. And I hope in the next few years somebody will be standing where I am and be making some remarks about Jay Sisler. I asked Bobby Clark, for some reason he was the spokesman that first day, what kind of an act they had. Oh, he said, we got a mule act. Well, good Lord, everybody's seen a mule act from every amateur punk and roll and on up. And, but he said, we Romans. He said, I Roman ride these mules. Well, I said, that's nice. What else do you do? Well, he said, I haven't jumped this hurdle. I said, how high is the hurdle? Oh, he said, about that high. But then he said, going around the arena, and I put the, uh, I put that little bar up about two feet over the, over the mules. And then he said, they go under it, and I jump it. And I said, well, where do you take your fall? Oh, he says, I don't fall. I jump over it and I land on it. I said, then you get back up and roam around. No, he said, I land with my feet on the two mules. I said, well, that's fine. He did it four consecutive nights. Gene knew no, had no peers as a man working with a cape. Let me say this right now. There's never been a clown combination of bullfighting and acts that will touch these people. Well, there have been guys, one of them is the sound of my voice right now, Chuck Henson. Never had, though, Buck Legrand and all those guys, they never had feature acts. And the only help I ever gave the Clarks, I got to name Bobby as Lord Beauregard Beaverbrook from Herefordshire, England. And that stuck with that act. And they were complete. Uh, good fortune is the uh, product of preparation. And these people prepared probably more than anyone I've ever known. Then they had the greatest act they ever had. Oh, they had the teeter-totter, first ones to do that. Uh, it was great. And they had uh, other things, sawing folks in half. And had one and uh, they just rehearsed it and Gene shot Bob in the face and they never did uh, do that again. I don't know what it was, but I bet it had been a good one. But they had this cannon keepers. And I'm announcing right now, and I gotta fly back to Tulsa, and then Donna's gonna meet me and take me up in Missouri, a little three-day rodeo up there. And I was talking to some people last night that still haven't figured out where Bobby Clark went when that damn cannon went off. And I'll tell you where it really sold. They worked the state penitentiary rodeo in Oklahoma one year. If you think those convicts didn't like it, there's not a cow in Texas. 
And you know, when that cannon went off, and it, you could hear it eight miles uphill off and against the wind, Bobby just had a little poof of smoke, and of course had a hole under him, down he went. Gene be looking for him, pull the old cannon with, uh, with covering down uh, to the ground and, and put it right over the hole. And then about that time, you'd hear this uh, squeal like a banshee or a, a scared cougar mama coming out of the stands. There'd be someone dressed just exactly like Bob. And people still have not figured out. They know, they know they didn't blow Bob up there but they don't know exactly where he went or why he went and how he got back. And to me, it's one of the greatest enigmas that has ever been. Anytime you're a bullfighter, kind of like being a bull rider, I guess, you're gonna, you're gonna compete hurt a lot of times. And years ago, Gene was in old Mexico. He wasn't afraid to apply his trade anywhere there was something to fight. And a bull ran his horn in his mouth up through his jaw, outside, clear above his eye. Now that was 30 years ago in 1967. And there he was in a small town in old Mexico. And they had never heard of penicillin. They hadn't heard anything. They couldn't get back. And he almost died. And probably should have died if he wasn't as tough as a cowboy. Bobby was telling him when he was healing up and hearing over, he said, well, you're lucky. He said, three-eighths of an inch over it, got your juggler. Gene said, hell, three-eighths of an inch the other way, and he'd miss me. So this is the way that they looked at life. Bobby got a shoulder broke and an arm broke and a leg broke, and it was in a cast for eight months in 1959. We look forward to the national finals every year, but you have no clue, unless you've got some gear in your head, as to how the first national finals was anticipated by people all over the country. I wonder if old so-and-so is going to make it. Who's going to be the secretary? Who's going to fight bulls? Who's going to be the announcer? Probably that accident cost Bob a job with Gene. Gene was the first one that was chosen in the ballot. Now, if memory serves me correctly, he worked it, I believe, with Buck Grant. Maybe I'm wrong, but Gene was there. So that injury probably kept, uh, kept uh, both boys from, uh, from being there. Another time, uh, uh, Bob uh, had his left lung punctured twice in six weeks, came to Chick Shea, uh, was just working the ax, Gene got in a little trouble, Bob went out to help him, took a hooking, broke nine more ribs. So these people have been there and done that. Who'd they work for? Who's who of our sport? Butler Brothers, Vold, Coburn, Steiner, Steiner probably from cracking the gate to start the gun entry, clear through as a complete a rodeo man as there ever was. First man to ever rehearse openings the night before rodeo. We'd never heard of that. Gene Bobby tell me how they had to get there a day early to help rehearse the opening that they had their own spotlight crew and all that went with them. I couldn't believe it. So they were pioneers in every, every sense of the word. And looking every time I stand under this, this uh, magnificent bronze of Casey Tibbs, the horse's necktie, owned by the late Elrin Jiggs Butler. And that was at Burwell in the mid, late 60s. I know I was there that year and announced that ride. I feel awful queasy up here. And we established the fact just this morning that Bob and Gene Clark were in the arena when this picture was taken. So that's the closeness that we all have with this, with this great hall. And you know, there's something besides two men who are dedicated, who work for the who work for the brand, who ride for the brand, who give you everything they've got. And that's two wives. A lot of times we overlook the women. And it takes a different breed of a gal to be a cowboy's wife. Anita and Phyllis have done those things, and they have hung tough for all these years. And I don't care whether you applaud Gene and Bobby when they come up, but make part of that applause for these two gals because they have earned it. Both these men are family men. Uh, Bob got smart when he retired, and I was fortunate enough to announce the last performance he worked in 77 or 78 at the old uh, the building there, the small building in Tulsa, where I first saw uh, Colonel W.T. Johnson rodeo when I was eight years old and found out that the pennants they gave all the cowboys did not necessarily uh, match your state. They gave me one from Utah and New Mexico and 
Heck, I knew I was going to get one from Oklahoma. But that's where Bob, uh, that's where Bob retired. Gene preceded him about two or three years before. Bob came back to Oklahoma. Gene went to ranching business up in the up in the Oregon country. But let me say one more time: the combination of the finest clown acts that our sport has has ever known, bullfighting as well as anyone has ever done it, and comedy. No one has ever reached. Maybe they've almost reached. It, but no one has ever surpassed. It. When they asked me to do this, I said it's one of the greatest honors of my lifetime. I don't mean that very sincerely. And I want to be the first to congratulate you, uh, Gene, and you, Bob, and thank you, first of all, for 47 years for, for being my friend and Donna's friend. We congratulate you. We love you. And you guys are all here. I've got to fly back home, and Donna's going to meet me at Tulsa Airport, and I've got to go 200 miles to work because she still likes to shop, and I'm supposed to have a cab. God bless all of you, and congratulations to maybe the greatest class this uh, building right here has ever had. The plaque shall read. Gene and Bobby Clark contract personnel. The Clarks began their rodeo career as competitors, both as calf ropers, Gene in steer wrestling and Bobby in bareback riding. Gene quickly moved to the contract side of the sport as a bullfighter, complete with Spanish-style cape. Bobby joined the act shortly after high school, clowning and working the barrel, then bullfighting. Gene and Bobby worked for all the top contractors and all the big rodeos for over 30 years. The Clarks were familiar sites at Madison Square Garden, Boston Garden, Houston, Fort Worth, and Pendleton. They also performed at Calgary, in Mexico, and Havana, Cuba. The Clark's creative acts were new and innovative and thrilled audiences. Many were never duplicated by other performers. The all-time favorites were the famous disappearing act, the Cannon Capers, the Hearse Act, the Magical Box, and Lord Beaver Brooks' Roman Riding Mules. Gene and Bobby Clark were influential role models for those clown bullfighters who followed. Born Gene Clark, March 27, 1926, Seminole, Oklahoma. Bobby Clark, March 24, 1930, Seminole, Oklahoma. Ladies and gentlemen, Gene and Bobby Clark, contract personnel. Thank you, Commissioner. Clem, uh, we started together and we ended together. Or I did, you're still going. Uh, I don't know why I get the honor always following people like Commissioner and uh, Clem McSpadden. I'm not a speaker, which you'll figure out real quick. Uh, I think I'd like to introduce my wife. This is Phyllis, come here, Phyllis. 44 years we've been married. She, uh, we've had three children. I'd like my daughter, uh, Brenda, and her husband, Chris Thomas, to stand up. <laughs> Anne and Cliff Underwood to please stand. <laughs> and we have one son, Kevin, and he's at home taking care of the place. He couldn't come up today. Um, you know, really, uh, I hear all this. I, I was born to be a cowboy. I wanted, that's all I dreamed about was being a cowboy. Well, me, I can't say that. I wanted to be a sumo wrestler, but I was too little. <laughs> but seriously, Gene actually uh, got me started working the barrel. I was picking apples for a dollar an hour in 1948 and toting a 16-foot ladder up the side of the hill, you know. So uh, he got me a job working the barrel at Bakersfield, California. 30 minutes of working the barrel, I made $25. Work one hour, I made 50. I said, hey, man, this is it. This is the thing to do. 
So we had a we had a long career, a lot of injuries, but it was worth it. The best part of it was meeting all my friends and making a lot of friends. And I'll turn this over to brother now. Thank you. Well, I'm at the age four years older than him that I have to write mine down. I can't remember. <laughs> um, but I'd have to say there's two words that describe my feelings at this moment. Complete elation. How many ways are there to say thank you to so many people? My biggest fear in selection is, am I leaving behind someone who, we will, who will be forgotten who is truly deserving to be inducted? Thank, the third thank you goes to my wife, Nita, of 49 and a half years, and my family. I hope they are as proud for me as I am of them. Our daughter, Debbie, and son-in-law, Roy White. <clears throat> Dave and daughter-in-law, Patty. And our grandson, Tom. And granddaughter, Jesse. Our youngest son and his wife, Joe, and our granddaughters, we use the Ds in our naming all of our kids, Desi, Dallas, and Danny. That's so we could remember. <laughs> and he's not able to attend because of business commitments. We have another grandson who was killed in a car wreck at age 16, and Dusty, who is a mother of our three-year-old great-granddaughter. Four of our grandchildren lean toward rodeo, and three are, are and were competing in swimming and softball. Jessie, our granddaughter, won the all-around for the high school rodeos in the state of Oregon last year. And Tom is on his scholarship at Cal Poly, and he's our last chance to keep the Clark name in the rodeo business at San Luis Obispo. He was third in the bull riding for college rodeo his freshman year. The fourth thank you goes to all of our friends, the ones who are present and the ones who couldn't make it. Your presence at our induction fulfill a dream that has come true. Each and every one of you are special to our family. Thank you. The next inductee, Elvin Evans, notable to do the introduction, world champion and Hall of Famer, Sean Davis. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, this is a day that I'll long remember, and I'm introducing a man here that's a great friend of mine and a great friend of rodeos. Everyone uh, should know Eldon Evans and should know of his accomplishments, but only a few of us know the accomplishment that Eldon has really uh, made here for the association and the directions he's provided. Eldon represents a group of people that's kind of the unsung heroes of the rodeo business, and that's the volunteers. In 1981, when I was elected president, I got, I thought, boy, this is a monumental task. At that time, I was popular, too. That's when I lost my popularity. <laughs> but I looked down there and I said, I need some guidance here. Uh, who can handle this in the financial end of it? And so that's the man that we chose to uh, serve as our financial advisor. In the next three or four years, uh, the association had some turmoil. Eldon Evans was one that took possibly a financial disaster and made it into a financial success. Again, during the reconstruction of the organization, they chose three people to steer as a steering committee, um, myself, Harry Bold, and of course we looked back and we got to choose the third one. We chose Eldon Evans. He was the one that guided us, guided us at that time. Then, as co-commissioner, while we're letting, uh, choosing the, uh, the commissioner to, uh, to 
run the organization has he, and I might say they made a wise choice. Eldon Evans and Bob Thane served as co-commissioners. Uh, the commissioner informed me last year when he took on the almost impossible task about two and a half years ago where he was going to raise four million dollars or four and a half million dollars and build this addition onto the Hall of Fame. He said that through Eldon's experience, he was also an asset, a, a very determined asset in making that all happen in that amount of time. Eldon, he's always believed in right and wrong, and, and I guess looking down here, uh, one thing about Eldon, if he believes in right, he'll, he'll darn sure fight for it. And I was looking down here at his, at his war record, and, and evidently he thought the Korean War was the rightful cause, because just to mention a few of his accomplishments, he was the United Nations Medal, he was the Good Conduct Medal, the American Defense Medal, and the Korean Presidential Medal. After he, uh, the Korean War, Eldon finished his bachelor's degree at the University of Denver in accounting and opened a, an accounting firm in Twin Falls, which was very successful, and become a pillar of a community, uh, a pillar in the community there at Twin Falls. Just a story that one of his friends was telling me, Eldon was always really observant. He's driving down the street being a pillar of the community, and he sees a lady in front of him with a stoplight and says, if, if uh, praise the Lord, honk your horn. So Eldon, he gives her a couple honks on, on the horn. She jumps out and comes back there, jerks opens his door, said, can't you see that light's red? <laughs> Anyhow, Eldon, you know, he rides a lot, and that's one of his hobbies or pastimes that we got him so busy with the PRCA. And uh, he came to me one day when I first took the job at the College of Southern Idaho, and he said, uh, uh, I, I was the head of the horse department. He said, would you come out and help me choose a horse? He said, oh, uh, Freckles is getting a little old. And, and uh, I, I'd seen Freckles before, and, and I could tell he was getting a little old. He was, he was a nappy. He was thir or 14 hands tall, and he had a 13-hand head. And the only one he'd get ride with him was, was the head of the cemetery was Harney, and they'd take a ride into the hills because everybody else was embarrassed of his horse. But anyhow, we picked out a horse for him and took it back back and there's a good looking Appaloose uh, thoroughbred and, and about four days later I'm out working some cattle and here comes his son who was rodeo for me at the time on this horse. We starts working cattle and before the day's over this horse bucked Russ off twice and I load him the trailer, he kicked the door off the trailer and I happened to be standing behind it and he kicked me about halfway across the across the road. So Eldon says what what should I do with that horse? I said, well, if it was me, I'd take him down there. You know them guys in Nevada, I'd take him down there on one of those ranches and let him ride him for about six months. So, uh, Eldon, he called up and got the horse down in Nevada. About three months later, he called me and he said, you know, that horse is doing great, but he said, I've got a chance to sell that horse to a guy. I said, if I was you, he's pretty tall, I'd sell him, Eldon. So, so he sets an appointment to meet the guy, take him down there to show him the horse, and, and I wasn't able to go that day, but uh, I called Eldon to see what, what happened, and he said, well, you know, I got started down there and this guy showed up, he's about 45 years old and he had a gal about 20 that looked like she could be a centerfold and playboy. And so, but anyhow, on the way down there, I explained to him that it's gonna take a pretty good cowboy to ride this horse. But when he got, when we got down there, the cowboys had the horse tied to the corral and already saddled. And this, he said, he walks over there and he slaps that horse on the behind. That horse kicks him with both hind feet. He said, I'm apologizing and looking at him and trying to get him up. And, and I said, he said that, he said to him, he said, I told you to take a pretty good hand to handle that horse. He said, that guy looked over at that girl, looked back at Dell, and he said, that's the way I like him, I'll take you. Uh, Eldon's Community Services, he was the founder of the College of Southern Idaho. He was appointed by the governor to the Board of Trustees, the five-man board of the College of Southern Idaho, and he's also Twin Falls Man of the Year. You know, Eldon's dad, was, and Eldon was brought up in the Depression, and his dad was a jockey. And at that time, the rodeo cowboy was a little bit different than they were today. They, they raised quite a bit of heck, not like the cowboy of today, the educated, uh, well-spoken, well-dressed cowboy of today. And his, and his dad warned him to stay away from the cowboy and the rodeo business. I guess if I was making a prediction today, and if, if his dad's looking at him today and looking down at this Hall of Fame and what else has accomplished, I bet he's mighty proud that he didn't take all of his advice. You know, one of Eldon's, he's accomplished a lot, but I think the accomplishment that he's probably the most proud of is the 
accomplishments and success with his family. And today with him, his beautiful wife, Dolores, who is his friend and partner, his two sons, Alan and Russ, and his three daughters, Kathleen, Nancy, and Maureen. They're all here today, and I know they're very proud to have the opportunity to see Eldon uh, inducted here today. Uh, if I had a comment to make about Eldon in, in introducing him, I'd like to say this. Although Eldon never entered a rodeo, never rode a bull or a bronc or bulldog to steer or roped a calf, in my opinion, he's the epitome of a cowboy. He's a, he's a true champion who has volunteered countless hours working simply because he loved the sport. He expects nothing in return except the pleasure of its success. And I think he's a symbol of what the PRCA stand for. That's integrity, honor, and the determination to try. At this time, I'd like to present Eldon Evans. The plaque shall read, Eldon Evans Notable. Eldon's father threatened him with his life if he ever became a rodeo cowboy. While he never competed in the arena, Eldon did become a true friend of the sport. He has given countless volunteer hours to the association over the past 20 years. A certified public accountant by profession, he first served as a financial advisor in 1981, served on the steering committee during the reorganization of the association, and was an interim co-commissioner and served on the board of directors from 1988 through 1996. He was named PRCA Rodeo Man of the Year in 1987. Evans, a veteran of the Korean War, was a founding father of the College of Southern Idaho and served on the Board of Trustees for 12 years. In 1965, he was named Man of the Year by the Twin Falls, Idaho Chamber of Commerce. His wise counsel has helped guide the association through turbulent years. His peers believe he has always had the best interest of all the aspects of rodeo business at the top of his priorities in his decision making. Born April 26, 1930, Pocatello, Idaho, Evans, Eldon Evans, notable. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Sean. Well, Elizabeth Taylor told her husbands, I'm not going to keep you long. I. I'm very grateful for this honor. Uh, when Sean asked me several years ago, back in, I guess it was 1981, if I would give him just a little bit of help, I had no idea that it was going to last this long or end this way. This is really an honor. The uh, Sport of Rodeo has come a long way in the last years. The cowboy today is making more money in the arena in real dollars than he's ever made in his life. Also, he's taken advantage of the opportunities for endorsement. You, you can't pick up a magazine today w without seeing Tuff Hedeman's picture in it. And Clay and Jake are almost in as many. So they're, they're making good money that way. Also, a lot of them, are, because of their association with the PRCA are competing in team ropings, in uh, bron or bronc and bull ridings, and a lot of other uh, things of that nature. So they, they are making good money, and I, I can't think of anybody that deserves it more. Uh, two or three years ago, when we talked about putting this addition on the building here, the uh, commissioner decided that he ought to bring it to the board, and the board approved it. And uh, I was very happy to be a part of that. This whole addition, four and a half million dollars, is from contributions from outside of the sport of rodeo. By outside, I mean it didn't come from the membership itself. So the membership really didn't have a nickel in that other than what they wanted to give uh, personally. And I did win a steak dinner from the commissioner because I bet him at the time that he would have the cost of that building covered before we broke ground. Well, a year ago when we dedicated this, the cost had been covered by donations. 
Now, the commissioner did pay off, but he wasn't very gracious about it. I did get a steak dinner, but it, it was tough. <clears throat> the PRCA still has problems. It'll have problems all its existence. It's just, that's just the nature of the animal. The board of directors is doing a good job, but they make mistakes and they have to go back and uh, correct those mistakes. So I think everybody ought to realize they aren't going to be right the first time. I want to tell you again how grateful I am for this honor, and uh, I really do appreciate it, and I appreciate all of you showing up. Thank you. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Our next inductee, Bill Hervey Notable, make the presentation comment or introduction comments. The world champion and the Hall of Famer himself, Mr. Jim Shoulders. Harvey called me about uh, doing this. He says, I want you to do my eulogy. So uh, I pretty near got to kill him for him of getting me into this good high paying job, you know. At, uh, but uh, they also called me and told me that my time was limited to five minutes. I see they didn't tell McSpadden that. And I don't think they told Sean that. <coughs> And uh, they said, five minutes to tell what I know about Bill Hervey. Hell, I couldn't tell that in five days or five hours, because there's been a lot of Bill Hervey stories, you know. Uh, they've always called Bill Hervey uh, Mr. Wrangler. And I've uh, got my first Wranglers in 1947 at New York's Madison Square Garden. And uh, when Rodeo Ben and Ed Morse and Roger Lamatti and uh, I guess Norb Considine came and they had a semi truckload of Wranglers, shirts and jackets, and they give every contestant, all the contract people, even the grooms and everybody else associated with rodeo, two pair of Wranglers in a black snap button shirt with Wrangler in two inch yellow letters behind it on the back. and. Uh, when you went to the arena after that, it looked like a neon sign with everybody wearing black Wranglers. And, uh, and of course, it was, uh, uh, they signed, uh, I guess, I know Gerald Roberts, Toots Manfield, and, uh, and uh, Bill Linderman and a few other guys, I think Pettigrew and some, to uh, be in Dorsey's and use them for their uh, advertising. And of course, needless to say, they didn't, uh, need Jim Shoulders, an old kid two years out of high school, or really a year and a half. But I lucked out that year and won both events at New York. So the next uh, spring in 1948 at the Denver Convention, Norb Considine asked me if I wanted to be on the Wrangler team. And I said, I sure did, you know. And I'm still there, you know, wearing these things for uh, right out 50 years now, I have been. And it's, uh, it's been a real pleasure, and I've seen a lot of changes in Wrangler in all those years. And I mean, a lot of people come and a lot of people go. And some of the best crew is sitting out here that uh, came from New York and all over the East from uh, to honor Bill. And it's, uh, it's a pretty good feeling to see some of them that they haven't seen in a long time. And you know, of all them changes that have come about in, in rodeos, uh, I believe one of my favorite Bill Hervey stories is when they come up with these uh, stone morse jeans. And, and uh, Hervey says, uh, you know, I spent a lifetime trying to get a denim made that wouldn't fade and wouldn't uh, wear out. And damn if they ain't putting a denim in the wash machine with rocks to make it look like it's wore out. And, and it was always kind of an obsession with Bill to make them Wranglers last longer and not fade. But, but it didn't get it done. But he's always been 
I guess Wrangler was lucky when they got Bill Hervey to go to the selling Wranglers for him in, in the early uh, 50s, I guess it was. And I don't remember when it, the first time I met Bill Hervey. I, I think it was at a national sales meeting, or it could have been at one of the many really good parties that Wrangler used to give to the rodeo contestants at New York every year. And they, they had some pretty good joints they took us to. Uh, the 21 Club, the Stork Club, uh, Coke Cabana, and uh, and places like that. But it was uh, it was a, a a thing that when you meet Bill Hervey, you'll always remember him because uh, you better because he never forgets a name or a face. I don't believe. And I'll tell you what, the people that he uh, meets today will. Uh, He'll know you whether it's uh, a year from now or five years from now and call you by your first name. And I'd bet more on that than I would on five aces. I never saw a man that could remember as many people as, as uh, Bill Hervey does. It, you know, he, he, when he started selling Wranglers, he started selling rodeo too and has kept it up from the time he was a salesman until he uh, become president and while he was president of the of the Wrangler Association or Wrangler Company, that is. He always sold rodeo as well as uh, Wrangler shirts, jeans, and jackets. And I've been with him when he, uh, you know, like I said, these changes that have been made in the, in the Wrangler Company. I was there when uh, it was Bluebell Wrangler, and then it went to the private uh, uh, kind of ownership amongst the employees and all, and then when it went to VF Company, but Hervey was there and he sold Wranglers as well as sold rodeo and, and always have. I was there whenever they uh, got kind of away from the rodeo sponsorship, more into the, uh, well, at uh, one time they got way into the stock car business and uh, Willie Nelson concerts and, uh, and hired a bunch of uh, movie actors to be the uh, ads. and. And it was Bill Hervey that kept telling the ad people and the executives, he said, stay with what brung us, boys. Rodeo got us where we are today, and we need to stay with what brung us. And I've heard him say that quite a lot of times, and he's always been our man to sell rodeo. You know, Hervey <coughs> says he was never a cowboy, and uh, he never claimed to be. And after being on a trail ride in uh, Canada last May with him and saw him on a horse. Now, I won't say he was riding that horse, but he was on him, you know. <laughs> and, I, and I'll tell you for sure, even though he was raised in Texas and all, but I'll tell you for sure, he ain't a cowboy. <laughs> but, but being associated with Bill Hervey and uh, for all these years and being a very good friend and a buddy, I can tell you one thing. He's damn sure a rodeo man. Bill Hurt. The Black Chilry, Bill Hervey Notable. Bill Hervey, known affectionately as Mr. Wrangler, has been a friend of rodeo for over 30 years. He started with Wrangler in 1957 in sales, moved up throughout the company, becoming president of men's wear division in 1985. His Western roots have provided a platform for his involvement and dedication to Wrangler's continued support of rodeo. Bill's vision is responsible for the development and continuation of the official PRCA dealership program, which linked the sport with a network of Western wear dealers and new audiences of potential rodeo fans. Hervey, the 1988 PRCA Man of the Year, has also been a longtime supporter of the Miss Rodeo America organization. He served in various capacities for that board and is credited with nurturing and helping to maintain the Miss Rodeo America scholarship program. I can't even ride a mule. Horses and mules scare me to death, to say nothing of the rough stock. That has not stopped Bill Hervey from becoming one of the best friends ever of professional rodeo and the rodeo cowboy. Born November 11th, 1924, Greenville, Texas, Bill Hervey Notable.
if I get through this without bawling, it'll be an absolute miracle. I don't think any one of you guys have shed a tear yet. I believe Jim almost did. But at any rate, uh, I heard Lou Holtz one time was being introduced, and uh, this guy went on and on and on. Finally got around to introducing Lou. Lou said, thank you very much, Packy. I love that introduction. I could have listened to it all night, and I thought I was going to have to. But I'm like, uh, who was it? Was it Gene that said we weren't going to keep you prepared? No, it was, uh, well, one of you said we're going to keep you very long, but you did. But I'm also like uh, Gene Clark. I'm going to have to read mine. And we got to talk about Jim Shoulders. I tell you what an honor it is to be introduced by a legend like that for a guy like me that really is scared to death of a damn horse. Uh, and to have Jim Shoulders introduce me to accept an award like this, it, it's just an incredible thing. I don't know how well all of you know Jim, really, but he is quite a funny man. One of the funniest things I have ever heard him say was we were talking about food not long ago, and Jim said my favorite vegetable is cream gravy. <laughs> That's the kind of macho guy he is. Well, let's get on with this thing and get it over with. How about that? In my lifetime, I found myself in many improbable situations. Without question, today is the most improbable of all. I remember another improbable one. It was a muddy ditch in Germany. And that was very improbable because those folks never did understand that my mama didn't want me to be there. She kept telling them to send me home, but they didn't do it. But anyway, this is about the most improbable situation that I have ever been in. From Borland Street in Greenville, Texas, to the hallowed halls of the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame in Colorado Springs, just does not seem possible. And yet, here I am. I'm so honored and so humbled to be in this place where so many true legends of our sport have been and will be recognized for their achievements. I feel I owe my presence to so many people of the past and the present who gave me opportunities through companies called Bluebell. Wouldn't you know that damn train had come by? This doesn't count against my time, does it? Well, my daddy was a railroad man, so I guess I ought to be nice about it. I'm going to start over. I feel I owe my present to so many people of the past and present who gave me opportunities through companies called Bluebell, Wrangler, and the VF Corp to continue to contribute to this wonderful Western way of life and to the sport of rodeo. All of their names should be mentioned here today because this honor belongs to all of the folks who have labored so long and so hard to build the Wrangler brand and the sport of rodeo over so many years, and not just to me. And that list seems endless, and to mention only a few seems unfair to all the rest. But I must take that risk because there are some who from the beginning were paramount to all that came later. First and foremost, there is, there is Hoppy. My wife, <clears throat> Damn it, I knew it. My wife and my pal for 50 years. Hoppy's pretty shy, except uh, when in private. <laughs> Without her support, none of this would have ever happened. And by the way, almost alone, she raised our four fine sons. Stand up, boys. While I was on the road doing Wrangler things, and right here while I'm in family things, I'd like the rest of my family, there's about 412 of them. If y'all would all stand and be recognized, please. They've come from Portland, and they've come from Hawaii, and they've come from everywhere to be here today for this thing. As I said, but uh, some of these from the past, uh, without whom, 
there never would have been a beginning. Some of them you've heard of and some of them you have. Jim Shoulders mentioned some of them this morning. I have to mention them again. People like Ed Morris, Roger Lamatti, Ed Lucas, Norbert Considine, and of course Jim and Sharon Shoulders. Fifty years ago, they started it all, and they gave the rest of us the opportunity to nurture and cherish it. And folks in recent times to whom I owe so much, a great deal of gratitude. Thank you, pal. At our sales meeting, they used to give me red wine. Uh, I'll take that, though, right now. In recent times, uh, there are a lot of folks that I owe a lot of uh, credit and, 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 and have a great debt to. Of course, Lou Cryer and all these wonderful, wonderful people here at this PRCA. They've just been unbelievably great and supportive of me. Rihanna Wadhams and all of my friends in gang at the Miss Rodeo pageant, all whom have supported me. And there's a lot of you out there whose names I cannot go through, but you all know who you are and you know how much I love you. They're extra special Wrangler people who work so hard yeah, this is bad. to do all their necessary preparation in presenting my name to the PRCA Hall of Fame Selection Committee. Don Laws, Bill Coronas, Louis Russo, my business right arm for so many years, Vaughn Adams, as I said, this list is endless, so I must close by saying again, thanks to all of you past and present who made it possible for a guy who can't ride a mule or anything else to have one hell of a ride. Thank you. to stay up here a while. <laughs> Our next honoree, Swanee Kirby Stock Contractor, for the introduction, a Hall of Famer, Mr. Chuck Henson. going to be tough. It's a great honor to be here today to introduce Swanee. But I'm taking the place of a great man. Flip Harmon passed away just before Salt Lake Rodeo. And he was supposed to be here to do this. And I know we're all going to miss him. So if I can get through this speech, it'll be, be something. But I know I can't fill his shoes, but I want to try to get done what I can up here and introduce Swanee. And I know everybody here has said a prayer for Flip and his family. Thank you. So, from the Red Rock Rims of Moab, the snow-capped peaks of the Wasatch Range, and for this friend of mine, the rodeo announcer used to say when he started all the performances, and that was pretty much an introduction for Swanee Kirby. Swanee is a real western cowboy, born in Moab, Utah in 1917 in a little rock house. And uh, I don't guess his family is very rich. They, had, they ran a few cows up there in the mountains around uh, Moab. His father was Eddie Alexander, and his mother was Laura Estella Burr Kirby. His grandfather was a Mormon pioneer down that country. His name was John Atlantic Burr, historically known for the, the Halls Crossing Ferry and the Burr Trail. Swanee graduated from high school in 1935. And then he started cowboying around down there. 
His dad ran these cattle up in the high country above Moab up there in those red rock rims. Not much grass and less water. He also had some race horses and trained them and bought and traded horses. And so when he got started breaking race horses and riding them, and he was, when he was younger, he was a jockey. He rode horses, I guess, around the races until he was about 17 years old, and then his mama's good cooking took over, and he couldn't make the weight anymore, so he started working for ranches around there and got to know all the country and all the cattle, water holes and things like that, which is really tough down there in those, those rims. He uh, gathered up a bunch of cowboys one time to the Bureau of Land Management, asking to get a bunch of cowboys and go out and gather up all these wild horses and get them off the range, and Swanee did. I guess it was the last great wild horse round up in that country. They say that uh, at one time, Swanee and his cowboys gathered up 250 head of horses, one big box canyon. Got them all. In total out of this, they had about 650 head. They shipped a bunch of them, but a lot of them stayed there, and the cowboys broke them, made good, <coughs> good cow horses out of them, because some of them pretty good bloodlines, crossbred with those range horses. Some of them didn't get broken very good, and they went into the rodeo. Swanee, he gathered up some of these and started a little rodeo outfit and gathered up some of old range bulls out there that didn't have any brands on or something he couldn't hardly read. <laughs> Slapped a great big old brand on them. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> started putting out some little rodeos around there. Well, they didn't have any way to get them to the rodeo, so he just trail herded everything. And uh, start out early and get there and time to put the rodeo on. I guess the first rodeo that they went, was, went to down there was Monticello, Utah. And they uh, trail herded everything down there. And then later on, he, he went to uh, Thompson, drove the herd over there, and then uh, put them on the railroad. And shipped them around, made some other rodeos around the country. And I guess those bulls down there that Swanee had, they, were, they needed a little improvement. They didn't hook enough, didn't have long enough horns. So he went down in the south country and got him some bulls that would hook, and I think he got a bunch of them for Jim Shoulders. I know he had some that would hook. Brought them back up there, and these brambers got to breed them, and they got some good rodeo bulls. In 1940, he moved out and got uh, produced rodeos around that country. And then 52, later on, they moved their location. Swanee and Verda, his wife, they were married in 1938. They had three kids, Bud, Barbara, and Vonna. Raised around rodeos, now active in the rodeo business. Swanee and Verda, Bud and Evelyn. Oh, it's hard to keep a round hat on a square head, I'll tell you. Uh, Wendy and Jeff Flitton, Lori and Martin Pierce, also family members. They were famous in the rodeo business as Swanee and Virgis for Craig Latham, well-known, outstanding saddle bronc ride, rider, and the late Deke Latham. Over the years, Swanee's had over 350 head of livestock go to the national finals. He's been there every, at every one of them. He's had livestock since 1959 when they first had it. Some of his most famous horses were Alley Cat, 1977 Bareback Horse of the Year, Hiram Special, got an award for 20 years at the NFR. Now that's a long time for anybody. In 1990, he had a top saddle rock sparrow. And around 1980, he started a breeding program. The little horse he bought out of Lander, Wyoming. He was a uh, Shire Cross, we called him Rony Pony. And I, I remember when he was, had all these little roan colts around his place up there at Salt Lake. Well, they were cute little fellas, and he raised them by hand, and a lot of them turned into good horses. There was Reception, Deception, Lop Ear, Rony Wiggles. And one horse comes to my mind that Swanee had, it was, he was something to remember. His name was a Purple People Eater. A lot of cowboys didn't like him, but he was a good clown act. 
You could ride out about halfway out of the ring. He ran just as hard as he could, and if he spurred him in the belly, that which was a mistake, he bucked. And if he did that, he'd throw you halfway out of the county. His famous bulls that he had was Drive Alley, Baldy Line, Fuzzy Four, and a lot of them I remember from the bottom up because they get me down and tear up the clown toes. And it's a good thing I had some good Wrangler pants because I mean I had some holes in them. The bar tea is well known around the world, and from the hum humble beginnings to the dean of rodeo, businessman, showman, and gentleman, and most of all a cowboy, my friend Swanee Kirby. The Black Shill Reed, Swanee Kirby stock contractor. Swanee Kirby started his rodeo career over 50 years ago, rounding up wild mustangs and range bulls. He trailed that string to his first rodeo at the Grand County Fair in Moab, Utah in 1945. From that first rodeo, Kirby and the Bar T have taken pride in producing fast-paced, exciting rodeos for the fans. Kirby joined the Rodeo Cowboys Association in 1949 and produced his first RCA rodeo the same year in Grand Junction, Colorado. Over the years, he produced rodeos or contracted stock for rodeos throughout the Rocky Mountain region and the Pacific Northwest. Bar T stock has been selected for every national finals rodeo since 1960. Alley Cat, Hybern Special, and Sparrow receive special recognition as outstanding Kirby animals. Swanee Kirby lives the Western lifestyle every day and has no regrets about the road he has taken. Fifty years is a long time, but a man in rodeo really needs two lifetimes. One to get an outfit together, and the second one is to enjoy it. Born January 23, 1917, Moab, Utah, Swanee Kirby, stock contractor. I'd like to thank everybody I ever worked for in my 50 years of rodeo. I want to thank the board of directors here, uh, all the rodeo committees that I had to do, and especially the committee that decided that I was a selection committee should be here in the Great Hall of Cowboys. I uh, would like to thank my family, my wife, Verdi here. She's been up with me for 60 years, and uh, <laughs> I suppose I suppose it's not been easy, but uh, anyhow, it happened. I want to thank my three kids. Tess, Barbara, and Bud. <clears throat> Bud and Evelyn have been a um, big help in the rodeo business. I mean, Bud, since he was, uh, is my son. My best friend and my partner. And uh, ever since the Ben Aparti Rodeo, why he has been big enough to put a saddle on a horse, I, he's been there to help me. So uh, I don't uh, know if I'll probably never pay him. I want to thank a special person. Uh, her name is Jerry Verdi. There goes the train on the bus past the second Anyhow, she has helped me along the way, and uh, her daughter, Elisa. Now, with all these people that I've mentioned, if I hadn't had their help, I 
this rodeo business has been a hell of a lot tougher. And uh, I just want to thank To kind of make this cowboy dream come true. I thank you. Our next inductee, Jake Barnes, team roper. To do the introduction, Ricky Green. when you think about Jake Barnes is that any header who can put up the same heater for 10 years should automatically go in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> there are only a handful of rodeo greats that reach such a pinnacle of success to be known with just a mention of their first name, such as the legend of Jake. There's only one other person that's done as much in Team Open event, and that's his partner, Clay. Together, they hold every significant record for Team Open, most money won in one season, most money won at the NFR, the fastest average time at the NFR and most world championships. They've set arena records all over the country, thrilling fans and competitors alike. They have accomplished what every team roper's wildest dreams are made of, and it couldn't have happened to two finer gentlemen. Jake and Clay are responsible for inspiring thousands of fans to either watch team roping or start roping themselves. Team roping's busting loose with incredible growth rate every year, all because of the excitement of watching these great ropers make run after run with speed, consistency, and beauty. A career like this is not just handed to you, it takes hard work and persistence. Everything that Jake is or has accomplished, he has worked hard for. During his first years in the PRCA, it was apparent to everyone he had loads of natural talent and he had every header going down the road watching every run he made. One reason for that was they all knew that Jake had, a, had what it took to be a champion. What really scared them was his enthusiasm and his work ethic. When you have a natural talent, Combine it with a persistent perfectionist, that spells superstar. Jake might be sound asleep at three in the morning, wake up and start thinking about roping, jump out of bed and go out and start roping the dummy head. Isn't that kind of weird? <clears throat> I pull into rodeos at two or three a.m. in the morning, crawl into the camper to quit, catch a quick nap before the seven a.m. slack and have to listen to Jake roping the dummy before he'd go to sleep. Sometimes I yell, yell out, okay, Jake, you're good, you're good. Now can we get some sleep? Jake set his goals high and then he races towards them. There's a difference between dreaming and setting goals and reaching goals. During Jake's second year in the PRCA, we are on one of many all-night drives. So far from anywhere, all you could hear was static on the radio. And Jake asked me if I'd like to win a world championship. I said, yes, I would. And he said, just one? He, he said, I want to win four. Go buckle for me, my mom, my dad, and my sister. I thought, dream on, Jake, as we travel traveled along in our three-quarter ton Chevy and extra narrow two-horse. Jake wasn't dreaming. He was working every day to give 100% to reach his goal. As I watched Jake win one, two, three, and then four world championships, I told my wife Kelly, well, he did what he said. He's one, he's one to go buckle for everyone in his family. Now maybe somebody else will have a chance. But something traumatic happened to the team open world. Jake got married to Tony in 1990, and they have five kids. So Jake's family got bigger, and here came Go Buckles 5, 6, and 7. The way I got it figured, he needs three more buckles. And don't laugh, folks, he's proved to me seven times. Not many sports stars can stand up to the scrutiny of fan expectations and your fellow competitor's idea of humility and camaraderie. Jake Barnes has managed to keep his feet on the ground, sticking with the values his parents, Raymond and Tootsie, have taught him from a boy honesty, humility, hard work, and perseverance. Jake's been a leader in the Christian Cowboys Fellowship, teaching Christian rodeo camps, helping the youth of America to understand to be a true champion. It takes more than fast times and go buckles. You have to keep a balanced life and rodeo career. Jesus first, family second, and rodeo third. This recommendation will make more and more of our young rodeo stars of the future into athletes we can be proud of. 
Jake is always ready to lend a helping hand wherever he's needed, from helping someone with a rope and to hauling a horse for a fellow competitor. He's also the first one to try to cheer you up if you had a bad day at the rodeo. He's a graceful loser, taking everything in stride, but he hasn't had much practice losing. Always ready to encourage his fellow competitors. One night, Jake encouraged me to reach a goal that I had set. We were driving to Odessa, Texas on an all-nighter. We we're all tired, and I drove by our exit by 150 miles. <laughs> so when I woke Jake up to drive, he encouraged me rather vigorously to drive back the 150 miles to the correct highway. And when I woke him up the second time, he seemed a lot happier, and I suppose he was just happy to see me reach my goal. Well, it's been a great honor to have been asked to speak on behalf of the greatest header to ever shake out a head loop, as well as being a good Christian, a great husband, and a wonderful father to Tuff, Bo, Shelley, Sonny, and Anthony. He's a bomb throwing us, not jerking us, bear knocking us, steer hopping us, header to ever live. Heck, he's Jake. The Black Show Reed, Jake Barnes, team roping. Jake Barnes says he was born to swing a rope. Few would disagree with that. After joining the association in 1980, he qualified for the NFR his rookie season, heading for Alan Bach. He then partnered with the legend Leo Camarillo. With Clay O'Brien Cooper, header Barnes found a pattern which led to a record seven world championships in the event. Barnes shares the record for the highest team roping single season earnings, $99,048 in 1985. The NFR payoff of 44,946 in 1994, and the NFR team roping average of 59.1 seconds on 10 head. He was the Dodge National Circuit Finals winner in 87, 89, and 1995. Barnes was also the Turquoise Circuit team roping champion, 85 through 89, 1992, 1994, and 1995. It's been my dream since I was a little kid to be a world champion. All I ever wanted to be was a champion to wear a world champion buckle. Barnes now has seven to choose from, and he hasn't even mentioned retirement. Born April 4th, 1959, Huntsville, Texas, world champion team roper. 1985, 86, 87, 88, 89, 92, and 1994. Jake Barnes, team roping. Well, it's a great honor to be here today. Uh, first of all, I think uh, I got to give all the glory to God because uh, without him, this all couldn't be possible. Uh, it's this has just been a fairy tale dream for me. Uh, seemed like just yesterday in 1980, I got a phone call from <clears throat> Alan Bach, invite me to uh, join the PRCA, and I caught a plane out of Austin, Texas, and <clears throat> flew up here and bought my card and started rodeoing. And now, 17 years later, I'm up here. Uh, standing in front of everybody being inducted into the Hall of Fame and this is just such a great honor. But the the thing that that, that I, I'm here for mostly is to uh, share this with my family and my friends because uh, without their support and without their help, you know, and, and also all the fans throughout the United States, it's cheered Clay and myself on and and it, it's just a great honor. and. Uh, you know, I, I, I've been one of the fortunate team ropers to, uh, I've only had three team roping partners, and I've had the honor to head for three of the uh, greatest healers of all times, <clears throat> starting off with Alan Bach, and then Leo Camarillo, and then in 1985, uh, Clay and I started roping together, and we won five championships, consecutive camp championships, and then uh, we won two others, and. It's just, you know, it's unbelievable to, to accomplish this. And I, I, like I say, it's still, it, it, reality hasn't set in, but uh, I feel that I, I have a lot more to contribute to rodeo and I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I just want to thank my, my mother, my father, my sister, and 
my wife and my kids because they're they're the backbone of this whole thing and uh, I, I'm not much of a speaker and Ricky did a heck of a job and I thank him and his wife for coming up and flying out here and taking their time to uh, to present me up here and thank you very much. Our next inductee, Clay O'Brien Cooper, team roping. The introduction, Coy Huffman. He told me the short winded get to speak again. Here we go. It was in the early 60s that something was about to happen that would amaze the team roping world. God gave a son to the Cooper family, a champion to rodeo, and a friend to me. Three years later, he discovered his destiny. Stepfather, Gene O'Brien's Rope and Arena in California, San Fernando Valley. His favorite toy became his rope. And Clay, under the guidance of men like Don Beasley, Tom Absher, Ben Johnson, a neighbor, and a Hollywood star and a world champion team roper as well. The seed of the dream of being a world champion team roper was started in his heart. And that seed was watered by cowboys like Leo, Gerald Camarillo, Walt Woodard, John Miller, wise world's champion. And then along came another cowboy, his father, Joe. That time in Clay's life, he learned to win from the outside. By the time he was six, he was winning at jackpot ropings. Nine, he'd won his first buckle. And then his father, Joe Cooper, helped him to learn how to win on the inside, along with Alan Bach and Jimmy Cooper. Clay made a commitment to Jesus Christ and began to live a positive lifestyle. His horsemanship and rope and talent landed him a role in the movie called The Cowboys with John Wayne. Appearing in several westerns with the Duke, it looked like Hollywood was going to be Clay's career, but then the call of rodeo was much louder. Clay left the silver screen to join rodeo, except for one stint on stage on the first National Finals Rodeo at Las Vegas, Nevada, we put on a play called The Prodigal Cowboys, a comedy at Samstown in Las Vegas, Nevada. And Clay's role was playing the bad guy, Lucifer Lust. Our budget was kind of low, so we borrowed clothes from the Western store. Well, he was back backstage going over his lines, all dressed up, with a mustache, handlebar mustache, dark glasses, cigar in his mouth, a bag of marijuana in one hand and a bag of Columbia cuckoo dust in the other hand. As he's walking around, he gets too close to the door and the alarm goes off and here comes the security and that caused a no small stir with the security. Well, finally we got him on stage. Of course, Jake was playing the role of the Chinaman, Hop Singh. Well, the production was so exciting that people couldn't even get into it because more people showed up and we had room. They got in a fight on the outside. So we had to go up to two showings. But if Hollywood ever gets that script, you'll see Clay back on the movie screen again. The road to the first National Finals Rodeo was a little tough for Clay. For six months, he and his partner, Brett Beach, they endured failure and the frustration that comes from not winning. Fourth of July, Cody, Wyoming, Clay made a decision before God. He was at the point of turning back or going ahead. 
almost to the point of no return, he backs into the box, and all of a sudden, the years of preparation and praxis, his dream exploded into reality. Brett caught the steer, Clay went in, snared two of them, and they went on a winning spree after winning that round at Cody, Wyoming, that took them to the National Finals Rodeo in 1981. The next two years, Clay roped with T. Woolman, a world's champion, and he and T are still solid friends now. But it was in 1985 that God sent a partner, a lanky kid from New Mexico, to join up with them. And together, they won world titles and wrote a new page in the team roping history book. Clay is a friend, a partner. The Cowboy has won more titles than I can even write down on this page of paper. 13 times the National Finals Rodeo, three times runner-up to the title of all-around champion of the world, three times Dodge National Circuit Finals winner. He's won the Dodge truck three times. Today, he's a million-dollar Cowboy, top four in the world. Second go around here to Pike's Peaker Bus Rodeo, he leads the round with a six second run. How does he do it? Well, as a friend, I've kind of watched. And I picked up a few secrets from Clay. One thing, he's willing to do it. Whenever you ask him something, he's always been willing to go the second mile. Secondly, he's always seen others as better than himself. And that's caused him to practice that much harder. The inspiration to dream your dream, to be what you can be, and do and have the God-given desire in your heart. Today, a toe-headed kid about 30 years ago, 30 some odd years ago, is now living his dream. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome seven times world's champion team roper, Clay O'Brien Cooper. The plaque shall read, Clay O'Brien Cooper, team roper. Movie star, television actor, accomplished calf roper, premier team roper, healer, multi-time world champion, Clay O'Brien Cooper has led a charmed life. Cooper started roping at the age of six. He made his movie debut with John Wayne and the Cowboys and went on to appear in numerous Western movies and television shows. His calf roping ability placed him in the runner-up position for the world champion all-around cowboy in 1985, 1989, and 1992. His healing ability gave him a gold buckle in the team roping a record seven times. Cooper, who joined the association in 1978, holds the record with Jake Barnes of the fastest time, 59.1 seconds on 10 steers at the National Finals Rodeo. This record set in 1994 gave the pair the team roping average win in the world title that year. Cooper was the turquoise circuit all-around champion in 85, 86, and 87, 91, and 93, and the circuit team roping champion in 83 and 84. He was the Dodge National Circuit Finals Rodeo Team Roping winner in 87, 89, and 95. Since I was a kid, I always wanted to rope for a living. The best thing is being able to make a living for me and my family doing what I always wanted to do. Born May 6, 1961, Ray, Arizona. World Champion Team Roper, 1985, 86, 87, 88, 89, 92, and 1994. Clay O'Brien Cooper, Team Roper. Coy, thank you for uh, coming and, and uh, doing what you did. Uh, Ricky, that was, that was awesome, what you did for Jake. You know, this is kind of unbelievable, really. Uh, like Jake said, it, it's hard for it to soak in. Uh, Jake and I have, have lived the ultimate dream, but it's just, it's came one day at a time just doing our job, you know, just doing what we'd love to do. It's not like we set out to 
to be in the Hall of Fame or to to be glorious and do wonderful things. I mean that yeah, you kind of aim that away because that's the right direction to go. But all the success that we've had is for me it's kind of overwhelming. Uh, and the only way that I can put it into perspective is is I know that everything has to be just right. Uh, starting with a dream when you're just a little kid uh, of wanting to be one of the best ropers because that's the people that you looked up to and the people that you was around when you was a kid. Um, for everything to happen just right, you know, to, to, uh, to have the God-given talent to rope and to ride and to, to learn things and to figure things out and to watch people that you admire that you know that are, are the greatest in the sport and to be able to mimic them and to uh, try the things that you see them do and to be able to perform them. Uh, that only comes by God. I mean, I, I couldn't do that myself, and I realize that. Uh, to be uh, happen just right to team up with a roper like Jake, uh, the greatest header that, that'll ever live. I mean, that can only be designed by God. Uh, the people that, that my family, friends, uh, a lot of our championships have, have been through the encouragement of the people around us, uh, urging us on and saying, boy, you're doing great, you know, go do it again. Uh, you can do it. Uh, my, uh, my family and friends, uh, the encouragement, the, the being able to meet people throughout my rodeo career is the things that mean the most uh, to me. Uh, the championships, uh, being inducted into the Hall of Fame, and everything is great. Uh, but the memories, the, how you got there, and the things that, it, that took place to get you here are the things that are, are the most special. Uh, I thank my family and my friends uh, for supporting me and helping me and encouraging Jake and myself. Most of all, I thank Jake for putting up with me. You know, <laughs> they talk about it all the time. Roping together as a team is like a marriage. I mean, you spend all your time, you spend more time with your partner than you do with your family. Rodeoing is a tough sport. You're on the road all the time if you want to sacrifice to win championships. And uh, so I thank Jake, I thank my family, I thank Beth, she's, she's put up with me all my junk, uh, my kids, Bailey and Quinn. And uh, the neat thing about it is, from the way I believe, my perspective on God is my family's saved, my Christians, my, two of my best friends, Jake and Ricky, Coy. Uh, I know that one day, you know, this, this here on earth is kind of short. Uh, we only live for so long and we all die but there's a hereafter, there is a heaven, and my friends and my family are gonna be there, and that's awesome to me. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Congratulations again. Uh, nice uh, job. Well done. Our final inductee today, Tuff Hedeman, bull rider. To make the presentation and introduction comments, Cody Lambert. I'm here right now wanting to take a short intermission so I can get Ricky Green to write a speech for me. <laughs> I'd have felt, I felt really proud when Tuff asked me to come up here and introduce him out of, and tell you the truth, I feel like I'd have probably been disappointed if he'd asked anybody else. And uh, 
I've probably spent a little more time with him than anybody else and, and know a little bit more about his history. So I'm just going to get started by saying that 20 years ago, if you looked at Tough Hedeman, said he's going to be, in 20 years, he'll be inducted in the Hall of Fame while he's still active. He'll be a four-time world champion bull rider and have taken the sport of rodeo and the event of bull riding to a level that no one ever dreamed that it would come to, people would have just laughed at you. I would have just laughed at you. Tough would have laughed at you himself. Tough was a, Tough was a kid that he, want, he wanted to rodeo. He's a cowboy kid. We all roped and rode and always wanted to do that kind of thing. And Tough won the calf riding when he's about four or five years old. First one he went to. That's about the last thing he won for 10 years. Rodeoed every week, just about. But he didn't give up and he never, he never quit. And I think when people ask me what makes Tough, what makes Tough so great, it's, uh, it's very hard to explain that people that don't know it or haven't really excelled in a sport. Tough's not the most gifted athlete. Tough's not the most talented bull rider. He's natural ability. He has less than most of the guys that you see competing at, at most of the rodeos. But he's absolutely the best bull rider. And all that came from him. That does, that's a he never quits and he never gave up. So to go on about 10 years later when Tough finally started winning a little bit in high school, he was pretty good, but bull riding wasn't his be really his best event. 1981, he's a New Mexico State high school champion team roper. A couple years later, he's trying to fill his permit so he could join the PRCA. Back then, you had to win $1,000 to fill a permit. Took tough nearly two and a half years. We teased him. We told him he's going to be the first gold permit holder in the PRCA. <laughs> but then he drew, he didn't do it in the bull riding anyway. He drew a bronc called Kicking Bear at El Paso. And he won second in the rodeo and, and finally filled his permit. I'm kind of shortchanging tough a little here. It was hard for him to get entered in a lot of the rodeos at that time. There was, there was kind of an abundance of bull riders, and, and so he didn't get to rodeo all that hard, but he did go to several. Then uh, the very next year, he qualified for his first national finals, 1984. In 1985, I watched something happen in rodeo that, that uh, well, I'd been around for five or six years and, and I hadn't seen anything like it. Tough changed, Tough changed the way a bull rider looked at things. He single-handedly did it. He didn't know he was doing it, but he just refused to get bucked off. He refused to let go. We had another traveling partner there named Lane Frost. And the next year, another one named Jim Sharp got in with us. And they changed it. They brought the level of competition. They brought the level of the champions up to somewhere where I hadn't seen in my lifetime. You could no longer stay on 75, 80 percent of your bulls and be considered a contender. If you didn't ride 90 to 95 percent of them, you might you might do pretty well, but you're not going to be one of the guys that's considered gold buckle material. I know, because I was one of those guys sitting back there watching, right, in that 75, 80 percent of them. And uh, I drove a lot of, we went to a lot of rodeos with those guys, and, and uh, they said, you know, how's it feel to go with Tough, Peterman, Lane Frost, and Jim Sharp? And I felt like, shoot, makes me feel like I'm the worst bull rider in the van. <laughs> but we had a lot of, we really had a lot of good times, and then Tough, tough. 
he won the all-around championship at Cheyenne. People don't realize that he's done very well in other events, but he's here because of what he's done in the bull riding. From that first qualification in the national finals in 1984, he qualified every year until 1993, the seventh go-round. It might have been the eighth. I have I didn't write it down. That he uh, came off a bull. He came off a bull and he laid out in the arena. And that's the only time Tough Hedeman ever laid out in the arena. And uh, it was it was a one of the scariest moments in my life. I know the scariest in his. I walked out there and he's as calm as he could be and he looked up to me and said he couldn't move. And uh, that, was, that was pretty tough. But Tough had already beaten the odds more than once by just being able to compete and being able to be that good of a bull rider and then bringing the sport to the level that it was. No one ever expected him to ride again. I knew, I knew deep down that he wanted to if there was a chance. A year later, he never got on a bull for a year. A year later, his health was to the point where bull riding is very dangerous and he understood that coming in. But a year later, as the way that Tough rides bulls, he didn't stand any more chance of getting hurt than the rest of us. So a year later, Tough Hedeman came back he skipped 1994 and he came back in 1995 and had spent a lot of time home with his family. He, now he has two kids, his wife Tracy, and he didn't feel like traveling as hard as he ever did rodeo and going to 100 rodeos a year. And he went to, he went to several rodeos, he just went to the bigger ones and the bigger bull ridings. And he was a 1995 PBR world champion bull rider. Also qualified for the national finals, which that was his 11th national finals, by the way. And uh, a month before the national finals, uh, most of you know the story. Bodacious hit him in the face so hard it took over six hours of reconstructive surgery. First thing he asked the doctor when he wakes up was, would he be able to ride in six weeks? Well, that was one of the first things. What was his chances of riding at the national finals that year? He came in the national finals 30 pounds underweight and uh, had a pretty bad headache. If you, come, if you ever try to ride bulls 30 pounds overweight or 30 pounds underweight, you know it just doesn't work. But he still, he still made a pretty good showing. He probably rode six out of his 10 bulls that year. We made a trip to Australia the next week and we had to ride some bulls down there and, and tough. You could tell he's getting stronger every day. He scored 95 points on a bull in Australia that had never been ridden. The week after the national finals, after coming in 30 pounds underweight, getting on 10 of the rankest bulls in the world and then flying down there. And I know this isn't near as exciting as some of the other guys, that some of the other speakers, but this is a little of the stuff that I know about Tough. Um, he won his first world championship in 1986. He came pretty close in 1985. He, he led it all year. He went to the national finals. Still had a good national finals, but Ted Noose had an unbelievable national finals. And we all thought Tough would win it in, in ninety in ninety five, but he won his first or eighty five, but he won his first one in eighty six. Came back again, won the world championship in eighty nine. He won it again in ninety one. He's won the NFR average twice. First time they had the Dodge National Circuit Finals, he won that. I can go on for days telling you about all the things that he's won. But I'd just rather tell you a couple of little stories about Tough. Nobody called me and told me what the time limit was, and I talked kind of slow, and I'm a slow thinker, so I hope you're ready to be here a while. 
Well, we've heard we've heard stories about great winners and gracious losers. Tough Heathman is a great winner, and nobody that knows him would accuse him of being a gracious loser. I guess that's what's driven him to ride like he does. If uh, if you're at the national finals and you're in the dressing room and Tough gets bucked off his bull that particular night. You either walk in that dressing room behind him or you get in there and you get something in front of you for protection. You need some kind of shield. He's gonna come in there slinging bales, bull ropes, whatever, and he doesn't like, he doesn't like to lose. He hates it really bad. He's, I've heard him say before that he'd rather get run over by a car than get bucked off, and I really believe it when he says something like that. His toughness is legendary. It's, it's something that I've heard stories about Jim Shoulder's high pain tolerance. And the guys that tell me that story compare tough to Jim Shoulder's in that way. Like I said, that tough laid out in the arena one time, and that was because he couldn't move. When uh, we were rodeoing together, sometimes We'd get home from a trip and uh, we'd been going to lots of rodeos and he'd never said anything. And I'll call him Monday and see where he's at. And he's at the doctor getting something x-rayed. Didn't tell me he's hurt. I was with him every day. He never let it, he never let it show. And that's just the way, he, that's the way he is. And that's the way he lives. He doesn't want any sympathy and he doesn't give much sympathy. I know, because I wanted it, and <laughs> I didn't get it. But that's just pretty much the way that he lives. When he's a four-year-old, a cowboy named Taylor Decker slammed his, car, slammed his hand in the car door. Everybody's probably already heard this story. Tough didn't make too much of a fuss about it. Taylor started calling him Tough Nut. Pretty soon when he got in school, it got shortened as to Tough. His real name was Richard Neil Hedeman. Cowboys got a history of giving each other nicknames, and usually the more you hate that nickname, the more it's gonna stick with you. But I never saw a cowboy out there whose nickname fit him any better than Tufts did. The, that's about all I can say about my friend. I was asked the other day, I was asked in a little interview the other day uh, about my, uh, my proudest, wow. I was asked about my proudest moment in rodeo. And uh, I think maybe this is it. So I guess I, I guess I need to introduce my friend, Tough Heatman. The Black Shill Reed, Tough Heatman bull riding. Tough Heatman rode his first calf at the age of four. He roped calves, winning the first roping he entered. Rode saddle broncs at the age of 13, started riding bulls. He went on to win the New Mexico High School Rodeo Association bull riding and all around in 1980 and the state team roping and all-around titles in 1981. As part of the Sol Ross State University rodeo team, he competed in saddle bronc, bull riding, team roping, and steer wrestling. That team went on to win the NIRA Men's Team Championship. Hedeman, who has been called a cowboy from Central Casting, joined the association in 1983 and filled his permit at one rodeo and bronc riding. He qualified for the 1984 NFR his second year as a professional and has gone on to 10 additional NFR appearances. Hinneman passed $1 million career earning dollars in the mark in 1993. What could have been a career ending injury at the 1993 NFR has only made him more focused on what he considers the important thing in his life, his family. Richard Hedeman could just as easily have been nicknamed Tri. His fellow bull riders say that the can-do attitude is what made him such an outstanding competitor. Hedeman says he always knew his natural ability and balance would give him a career in the sport. Nine times out of ten when a guy gets bucked off, it's because of a weak heart. What I lack in talent, I make up an effort. Born March 2nd, 1963, El Paso, Texas, 
world champion bull rider, 1986, 1989, and 1991. Ladies and gentlemen, tough Hedeman bull rider. I'd like to say that this is a, is a, is a dream come true, but uh, there's no possible way I could have ever dreamed um, that I could be where I'm standing today. Uh, to me, my life has been a dream. And you know, I, I, I truly consider myself probably the luckiest person in the, in the whole world. To be standing here with, with the people who, who mean the most to me, uh, this is probably the greatest day that I'll ever experience. And that's, that's, that's my family and my friends. And that's, to me, that's, that, that, is, that, that is what it's all about. And uh, I appreciate, you know, when they, when they first called me and, and told me about uh, being in the Hall of Fame, like I said yesterday, I figured either number one, they were really bored, or number two, they were saying, you know, hey, if we put you in here, would you, would you go ahead and hang it up? But bad news, I ain't hanging it up. I, I still love what I do, and there's, and, 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 until, uh, you experience what a bull rider experiences, and I'm sure it's true in other events and other sports. Uh, but the feeling and the that, that you get from from getting on a bull that no one else can ride, being 90 points, uh, the, 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 there's the, there's there's nothing like that. And um, I got an opportunity tonight to go to. To Hermiston, Oregon, I've got a bull that hasn't been ridden all year. Um, he's got a bounty on him of about sixty-five or seventy-five hundred dollars, and that still excites me. That's 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 what I live for, and that's what I love, and that's that's the opportunity and to, to get on great bulls and and compete. And I remember Donnie Gay saying at one time, he said, "You know, age is just a number." And at that time, I said, "Yeah, yeah, right." You know. You're trying to convince yourself, not me. You're old. That's what they're telling me. But uh, like I said, I'm I'm not ready for that, and I and I, st and I still love what I do. But to stand here and uh, like I said, that, that, that this is this is to me is, is is the greatest day of my life. I've got my family with me, my wife Tracy, who through thick and thin has always been there and given me the two most wonderful gifts in the world, and that's. Trevor and Robert Lane, uh, my mother and father, Red and Claris, who gave me the opportunity and the and the support to to choose what I wanted to do. And my dad worked every day of his life. My mother drove us up and down the road, up and down the road, up and down the road. Uh, my brother uh, Roach, who many times uh, got me untied when I was in a place where I shouldn't have been. Uh, Jane, Cheryl, Kathy, and uh, everybody. Like I said, my family. That's 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 what means the most to me, and and and, and my friends. Um, like I said, I, I I grew up with it. Like I said, it's a dream come true because, I mean, I could have never dreamed this. You know, to me, success and. Like Cody said, you know, 20 years ago, people would have laughed at you. I, I thought maybe if I got my PRCA card, that that would have been it. I said, hey, I won. I'm at the top. I got my card. And when I when I when I was in the standings the first time in 1984, I looked at the sports and I was I was pretty sure it was a misprint. And then later on in the year, and I said, you know, something's going to happen. And there's, you know, the world's going to come to an end before the NFR, and I'm not going to get to go. That was. And one, once I got to Oklahoma City, I 
I'd never, never been so excited about anything in my whole life as when I got on my horse to ride in a grand entry, I said, wow, this is it. And that's, and, and that, that, that feeling never gets old. And last year when I, when I, when I go to the NFR last year, it's, it's, it's the same thing. But, but like I said before, the people, the people around me and the people that have always supported me and been there, uh, and that's the only way I could be here. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to win at, at times, but, but when you lose and you're down and out, uh, you know, I, I, I've experienced, you know, on both sides. And I gotta say, at, at, at the times of my injuries, that's, that's when I really, truly realized that who, who, who the people that I really care about. I remember Michael Gaughan coming in, uh, when I'd broken my neck and offering to fly me anywhere in the country to, he said, if you don't like this doctor, we'll fly you wherever you want to go. I never just, and then flies me home. And then and the next year he had to fly me home again. He said, that's it, no more, no more flights for you. Um, but it's an honor to be here, to, to, to be, I, you know, I look at the list of the guys in there and it's, uh, in there with my, you know, the guys I always looked up to, uh, my best friend and partner, Lane Frost, who probably had as big an influence on my uh, life as anyone who taught me that it was just as easy to make somebody smile as make them mad. That was really hard for me for, for a while. But uh, I, I thank everyone for coming. I'd like to also thank uh, my good friend, Ron Pack, who is trying to trying to make me uh, more of a business-like person uh, who helps me produce a, a couple bull riding events. Uh, my good friends, John Milano, Milano Hats, Bill Selman and Tony Pontura at, at Bud Light, Roland Mizrahi at, at Sidron Jackets. You know, those are the people that, uh, you know, whenever I was hurt, uh, said, okay, so what? You're hurt. You know, we're, we, we, you're still on our team, and uh, you know they, they, they were always by my side. So it's a great honor once again. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our induction ceremonies. Uh, Pat Hildebrand, I'll ask her to come to the dais here in a moment to give you some announcements, particularly for our inductees. We need you up here right away for some picture-taking sessions. But to conclude and to make it official, I, as the Commissioner of the Professional Rodeo Cowboys Association and President of the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame, it's with a great deal of pleasure and honor that I officially proclaim Bobby and Gene Clark, Eldon Evans, Bill Hervey, Swanee Kirby, Jake Barnes, Clay O'Brien, Cooper, and Tuff Hedeman. They are now Hall of Famers. Congratulations. Thank you all for being here with us on a special day like this. I do need the inductees um, to come up here by the bronze so that we can do a group photo we will not take very long to do this because lunch is also served in the garden, and I don't want anyone to miss that. So thank you again, and God bless you.